Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to our time where we are going to share in the Word of God together. This morning, Courtney and I are going to uh, preach together. We wanted to have more of a conversation as we begin into this new series. Before we do, I want to remind you that each and every day on our Facebook page at 6 a.m., we post our GPS. It's our guide for prayer and study. It's a way we stay connected through the Word of God and prayer together as a church family. All of of the prayers and scriptures this week are all going to relate back to the virtues we talk about today, to the things we raise here this morning. So it's a great way to continue listening to what God is saying as we move throughout this week. I want to remind you that's always there each and every day at 6 a.m. We're going to be in Matthew today, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14. If you want to read along, the words will also be up on your screen. I'll give you a minute to get to that. Um, Here this morning, we are jumping into a new series, and that series is called Share, and it's an obvious play on how we are in a Facebook world right now, and we share everything. We are all about sharing posts. Um, That is always what uh, we sort of live in each and every day. We get up and see what has been shared in our world, but we also live in the church, and as Christians, we are called to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, and especially as a new church plant. Um, We were planted in September. Um, Believe it or not, I know that sounds and feels like years ago, um, but it was less than a year ago, and we are here at the infancy beginning this journey together, and um, the fact that we have held together so strong financially, numerically, in spirit and faith and truth um, is just a testament to what God is doing here in our church, and we wanted to talk more specifically about that concept of growing a church, of what it means to be a vital church, what it means to be a growing church, how do we do that, what is our part to play in that. Um, Everybody sort of has an idea about what works and what doesn't, but most of those ideas come from people who have never done it before. Um, Everyone's sort of got opinions and ideas, and so one of the things, even Courtney and I, um, (laughs) but one of the things we wanted to do is try to look at some people who have been there before, who have done that before, who have experienced success and colossal failure, um, and sort of take their learnings as we try to move together. So we're going to do that over the next five weeks. I mean, it's all going to be based off of this book, The Eight Virtues of Rapidly Growing Churches. This is by Matt Miofsky and Jason Baiesi. I don't know how to say his last name. Um, but you can pick you up Matt and Jason's great. book. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Just uh, pretend you know how to pronounce it. Um, You can pick up this book on Amazon. It's like 12 bucks. Um, It's a great little book. It's a quick read. But we're going to look at these uh, virtues together. We're not going to go in order. We sort of pulled out the ones we thought were the most relevant and grouped them together in the way that made sense with some of the scriptures we picked. Also, we didn't want to preach this for eight weeks because even we would get bored of that. So we're going to do five weeks of this through June and then one Sunday in July. Um, So here this morning, we're going to look at two of those virtues, um, and those two are Rapidly growing churches believe in miracles and act accordingly. Rapidly growing churches believe in miracles and act accordingly. And the second virtue is rapidly growing churches work in teams. And so we're going to talk about believing in miracles and how do we act if we do truly believe in miracles um, and how do we work together in teams. And so to help us do that, we're going to look at a story that I'm sure you've heard. It comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14. We're going to read this together. Uh, This is starting in verse 13. This is a story um, I am quite sure that you have heard many times. Matthew 14, 13. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. And Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. Jesus replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. Amen, friends. Will you pray with me? Holy, gracious, and wonderful God, we come to you in a time of craziness. But God, we know you are faithful, and you have called our church for such a time as this. You have planted us here at the edge of a storm. And we are in the midst of that storm, but we know that you can walk on water. 
that you can calm storms, that you are faithful and you delivered the disciples through those stormy times to continue their good work that you started. And we believe that is true for us, that you have started us, called us for a purpose, that you will continue this good work, see it through, that you will be with us, that we have a calling that is bigger than the pandemic. And so God, help us over these next five weeks to talk about that calling, to talk about what it means to be a church that lives to reach new people, to spread hope in our area. God, help us today to understand that miracles are real, and it means that we are to act in a certain way, and that way is never alone, for you don't call us to do anything in isolation. God, we love you and we trust you. Speak life through these words and through Courtney and I together that you might be heard today and not us. Lord, we love you and we trust you. Amen. So this text, this feeding of the 5,000 is a very famous miracle of Jesus, and there are a lot of different ways to see uh, this in all scriptures. I believe there are various ways to interpret the Bible, and the two most famous, the two primary ways to see this um, is one, that this is just a straight-up multiplication miracle, that Jesus takes some fish and some bread, snaps his fingers, Thanos-style, except, you know, the life version, the opposite, opposite, (laughs) anti-Thanos, and... uh, and then there's food for enough for everyone. It just sort of like, you know, grows and grows and grows, and they can hand it out from there. Um, and that's definitely one way that we see this. And I believe that God is capable of that. I believe that if that's really what happened, I'm on board. That's the coolest version of this story, so it's the one I choose to believe. A lot of people have trouble with the miracles in Scripture, and they say, well, I don't know if I believe that. I've never seen a miracle. And if that's what God's about, I don't know if that's really what I'm interested in, because then why doesn't God snap, you know, why doesn't Christ snap his fingers today and get rid of the pandemic? How about that one? Um, So a lot of people have struggles with this, and I don't pretend to understand the will of God, but I believe that God is capable of this, and I think that that is an incredible uh, thing to keep in mind for me, the power and the divine um, work of God. The other way to explain and understand this story is that the miracle is not something that we would sort of describe as magical multiplication, but the miracle is that everyone that was there shared what they had, and when they opened their pockets, when they opened their lunchboxes, so to speak, there was more than enough for everyone to go around. And we think, well, that's not a miracle, but honestly, that it sounds like it is. I mean, if we all did that as yeah. a nation, we would not have homelessness, we would not have hunger, we would not have poverty. It would mean great sacrifice for a lot of people, and it's not an easy thing to do, um, but it would be a miracle. I've never seen that happen. And so, you know, I've never seen either one of these types of miracles happen to this level. Um, but when you see this, it talks about how there's more than enough, and both demonstrate how God works in this moment. And both demonstrate that God uses people in the midst of this. Somebody had those loaves and fish in one of the versions of one of the gospel. This is in all four gospels, by the way. We just picked Matthew because of uh, several reasons. Um, But in one of the stories, it talks about how there's a young boy who has this lunch, and that's what Jesus multiplies. He's like, hey, the disciples are like, well, this kid's got some food. And Jesus is like, that'll, that'll yeah. do. And then he sort of takes it. So someone has to step forward first and offer that. Um, and so you see in this moment that it takes people together. It also takes the disciples. Jesus says, go and distribute this food. Um, God does the miracle, but then invites us to go and take that provision that God has provided out to other people. And then, of course, if you look at it as the miracle, as everyone shared what they had, someone had to convince them to do that, and then everyone had to come together for that to be possible. One person, other than Jesus, can't feed that whole 5,000 people. The disciples even say that. They're like, we got to send them away. And Jesus says, no, you give them something to eat. And the disciples are like, what? There's 5,000 people here. And it's really just men. There's probably like 15,000 people there if you count women and children. Um, And so we see here that God does this miracle, no matter how you look at this story, if you see straight up multiplication um, from Jesus and the divine power, if you see that the miracle is that everyone shared what they had, both of those are miracles of God, and both of those require people to work together. And so we see whether you're sharing it and following in Christ's example of selflessness, the first shall be last sort of mentality, or if you see God enacting a divine miracle of multiplication here, both of them give us insight into how God works And we also get a little insight into how miracles work, not only back in Scripture, but also here today. Because sometimes we read this Scripture and we're like, yeah, 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 back in the day, but what about today? And so, Courtney, what about today? So, um, I think you raise a good point. I also have never seen a sort of divine, magical miracle like that. But I have learned to see God at work in ways. And what I have learned is that maybe it's not that miracles have stopped happening, we just quit calling them that. Mm, Um, So 
there's this reminds me of a saying that we have when we travel to Mexico, and that saying is, the house always gets finished. The house always gets finished. Uh, when we travel to build homes with Proyecto Abrigo, our partner ministry just outside of Juarez, we spend a couple of days building houses. And what I can tell you is no matter where we are at the end of day one, by the end of day two, we're going to lay hands on a house, bless it, pray for the families, break bread and share in Holy Communion together, and say our goodbyes. Every time, the house has always gotten finished. Y'all, I have been at the end of day one, and we've had four beautiful walls, and all we're waiting on is a floor and a roof. And I've been at the end of day one where we haven't even had half a wall. But somehow, the house always gets finished every time. And the truth is, it's a miracle sometimes, given where we are at the end of day one. But it's always, like the feeding of the 5,000 story, a miracle that takes a village. So I've been on teams where we have worked through and passed our lunchtime, where we have given up our last day, night out, dinner, where we get to see part of the city to get the house finished. I have watched the maestros, that's the professional construction workers that are employed on the job site to lead all of us who don't know what we're doing. Um, I've watched them work into the night behind us after we leave and then be back out there in the morning before we ever even get to the job site. And that's after they've worked a whole work week the week before. I have seen unexpected neighbors show up a dozen strong community members, just people who live around the house we're building, coming in and volunteering their own time and their own sweat um, to make this happen. I've seen other teams somehow finish their builds early when we are struggling and show up to help us finish ours. So we have a saying in Mexico, and that is that the house always gets finished. And sometimes it's a really a miracle because of where we were at the end of day one. Um, and sometimes it's just a miracle because everybody came together um, to make it happen, even if it went right on timeline. So um, you might chalk all that up to luck and nice people if you didn't believe in God or weren't looking for God. Like, that's so great that that person lived on a street with such generous people. Uh, you might... Think that, oh, that's so nice that you took a weekend to go across the border and build a home. There's a really nice people around in the world. Um, I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so what I see happening when all of those things happen, when the maestros get their second wind and they stay late into the night and show up in the morning, when community and family rallies around a family to make something happen, when people who live in the States cross the border despite any fears that they might have about that, when they give up their own time and money to go and serve with our neighbors in Mexico, every time I see the Holy Spirit at work, I believe that that is God's encouragement, God's strength and power moving in and among the people. Whenever people come together and dig deep and get sweaty and dirty and see the face of God in one another, despite all of our differences, that is truly a miracle and God at work. And every time, every time, the house gets finished. Now, it's always a miracle to the family that's getting to call that house home. And they are the ones really who taught me to start using this word again. They will use this word freely. They will say to you, it is a miracle that you are here. It is a miracle that we found Jose Luis or he found us and we got on the list to have this home. It is a miracle that the maestros are here to help, that the community is rallying around us to make this happen. They will use that word freely and they have taught me to see the work of God in my midst at a time when living in a very sort of rational, um, intellectual society, we've really stopped looking for that and calling it what it is. And so here's what I believe. When we are doing something worthy of God, something that's centering love of God and love of neighbor, God is going to show up, God is going to do big things, and we just have to know what to call it. These are miracles. I used to go to Mexico and worry at the end of day one, oh, we are just not going to finish. There's not going to be enough time. We don't even have a wall built. 
But now I go and I expect miracles and I act accordingly. And if you go with me on a trip, what you'll hear me say from the very beginning is the house always gets finished. Yeah, and it's, it, I love that saying that the, uh, you know, we don't call them miracles anymore. Like, it's not, they're not happening anymore. We just don't call them that. It reminds me of this quote I love. I don't remember who said it. I think it's like J.M. Bari or something. But um, it's that children believe in magic because they look for it. And I yeah. think it's that same sort of thing. It's that we, we as adults or we in modern America or we, you know, educated, we're not like these biblical people who didn't know anything. Yeah. Um, we don't believe in miracles because we think, well, we'll just explain it. They, you know, the silly people, there was some scientific reason behind what happened here and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think we don't often look for that. There's so much in this scripture that I think brings to life the miraculous work of God, how it includes all of us and what it has to say for us. Another thing I love about this passage is um, Jesus basically gives us some of the words that we still use in communion. Um, when we retell this story, I mean, he takes the bread, he breaks it, he gives thanks, and then he distributes it. I mean, it's like he's having communion there with fish and bread yep. um, for everyone. And so we see these little things all throughout Scripture that unite us together. Everything Christ did was meant to unite us and bring us together. We're not meant to do anything alone. And so you think that this incredible moment happens and the disciples are going to be forever convinced, like, God can do anything. You would think. But, if, you know, of course, right, like, no. Um, not with Peter <laughs> driving the train. <laughs> so the next the thing I love about this story is what comes next and what we see happening over and over and over again in scripture and in us. So the next story is Jesus walking on the water and Peter gets out of the boat, walks on the water as well. So Jesus goes to pray after he feeds these 5,000 people and the disciples get in the boat to go ahead and there's this huge storm and they freak out. And Jesus is like going to walk. Apparently, I never noticed this until I read it years after I went to seminary and it was Jesus is just crossing the lake on foot. Yeah. He's, I never noticed that. I was like, why is he out of the boat? And I was like, oh, he's just like walking. That's how he's getting across the lake, which seems like a little extra. Like, <laughs> come, just get in a boat, man. You're really going to walk across this really lake. Yeah, one. come on. Um, way to show off Jesus. Anyway, so he's walking across the lake, and he comes across the disciples who are freaking out in the boat. And he's like, what are you guys scared of? And then he said, you know, has that moment with Peter, get out and walk on the water. And Peter does. And then he sees the water and starts to sink and freaks out again. And Jesus is like, what are you, what are you doing? Why are you doubting? Why do you have this, uh, this brokenness? Why do you have this fear and this doubt? And I heard a sermon once from the great uh, Dr. Zan Holmes who said that this story demonstrates the reason that they have fear, the reason they doubt is because they forgot the lesson of the loaves. And I've never forgot that phrase. They forgot the lesson of the loaves. Because that's why Jesus is frustrated. That's why he was going to pass them by. That's why he sort of calls them out for doubting. It's not because being afraid of a storm is bad. It's that they just watched him feed 5,000 people. They just watched him heal people. They just watched him do all these miracles. And he's sort of saying, what do I have to do to convince you that I'm God? What do I have to do? And we see that in Scripture over and over and over again, the forgetting of the loaves, the forgetting of what God has done for the people the prophets couldn't shut up about that. They were constantly yep. saying, don't you remember the Exodus? Don't you remember how God liberated our people? Don't you remember the covenant God made with Abraham and Noah and Moses? I mean, just on and on, just harping on people. Don't you remember the exile and we came back? All of these things. I mean, the prophets just wouldn't let it go because people constantly forget. That's why in our liturgy, we have these acts of remembrance. Mm -hmm. It's a big part of communion and baptism is they are acts of remembrance. They're also more than that, but that's a key part because we have as humans have a really bad habit of saying to God, yeah, but what have you done for me lately, right? Yeah, yep. I know you did all those yep. things, but what have you done for me lately? If you'll just help me find a parking space today, if you'll just help me get to work on time, if you'll just help me pass this test, if you'll just help me get this job, what have you done for me lately? Yeah, yeah, machine. yeah. Like yeah, exactly. Machine. Yeah, I'm put another quarter yep. in. And it's ridiculous, and we have this pattern as humans where we do this. We forget the lesson of the loaves. We forget what God has done for us. We forget these miracles, and that's a huge reason why I think we need to work in teams. I think that's why mm -hmm. churches that are successful and grow fast is they believe in a miraculous God, and they act as if that God is miraculous and real, and they expect God to show up, and then they work together because we need each other, and everything Christ does is unites people and brings people together in teams, but it's also to remind us as dumb idiots who forget how faithful God has been. We need each other to say, no, no, no. I know we're scared of what's going to come next. We're a new church in a pandemic, but don't you remember what God did? Mm -hmm. Don't you remember how faithful God is? Do you really think that this is going to stop God? If we give up, yeah, that can stop God. People get in the way of God all the time. 
But when we start to doubt God, we need each other to come back to the table and say, friends, God is faithful. God has been there before we worship a miraculous God that's with us now and always has been. And friends, God has been faithful here at Grace Chapel, not just in scripture, not just in these big stories we tell, but here at Grace Chapel, even in these last nine months, God has been incredibly faithful. Yeah, I think sometimes we can even get on board with like, you're right, those houses going up in Mexico, those are miracles. That's awesome. That doesn't really happen here in our church. Right, that's a nice story. But yeah, that's beautiful. That's lovely. What but have you done for me? Here. <laughs> Great chapel. What have you done for us? Well, the truth is, um, remember what I said, not only does the house always get finished, but when we are doing work worthy of God, when we are doing things that center love of God and love of neighbor, God shows up. Every single time. And the work we're doing here at Grace Chapel, our mission is to eradicate homelessness in whatever form it presents itself. That is work worthy of God. Amen. God is going to show up. And so here is one way that I've seen God show up. I could tell a number of stories, but you want to probably eat lunch today, so I'll tell one. Um, we watched God show up in the middle of the pandemic. A few months ago, this broke out and we had to do social distancing and Alex and I found out all of our ministry was going to have to be moved online and like many other pastors we got really nervous about what the future of our church was going to look like and maybe a little bit more than many of our other colleagues because what we know about new churches the rule is grow or die there is no time for a plateau not even in a pandemic and we haven't been here for a hundred years and we'll always be here. Nope, we do not have that privilege. So um, we were concerned. We wondered, what are, how's our financial situation yeah. gonna be yeah. okay? How are we gonna maintain connections and relationships in our community? How are we gonna pull off online worship mm -hmm. when we haven't really been doing that in the past few months uh, since the church started? So we had a lot of concerns. And then you showed up. You showed up. You kept giving your offerings and your tithes. You engaged online in worship and in life groups and in the race talks and the pastoral care crash course that we had. You have shown up. Prayer group is growing and thriving. You showed up. And we don't discount that. That in and of itself is God's movement in the people of Grace Chapel, a miracle all on its own. And that's because we are up to work worthy of our God. But here's what I want you to know, friends. The story doesn't stop there because God was about to move and do something even bigger. Take all of that, all of your offerings, <laughs> and put them together with another offering and do something as big as feed the 5,000 people, at Mul least Multiply, for us. if you will. Multiply, yes, a little bit. <laughs> so, round about the week of Easter, when we were all celebrating the resurrection of Christ and the miracle mm -hmm. that that certainly was and is and continues to be for us, um, we received news that our church community got an unexpected $25,000 gift. $25,000 unexpected as an offering from someone who can see God moving in our work, who felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit and listened. Friends, that kind of gift to any church anytime would be a miracle. To a new church in the middle of a pandemic at a time when things seemed so uncertain, this for me was a clear word from God. This house is going to get finished. This house will get finished because we need a church that is going to make sure people have a physical home, an emotional home, a spiritual home. We have a real presence here in our community with a purpose that God is behind. And when we are doing work worthy of God, God shows up. 
we just have to start calling it a miracle again. It's crazy, too. There's a scripture in Malachi about, like, where God basically says, like, put me to the test. Yeah. Like, give, you know, you give and you you support the work of God. And let, let me show you what I'll do. And you know, I always read scriptures like that. And I'm like, all right, this okay. seems a little like, this, like pastors love to use this, like, just te- let's just yeah. test God together and see what happens. <laughs> but it's this moment where, like, we were freaking out. Yeah. Like, we were praying for our members of our church. They were, um, all of us, very concerned about job loss and the economy. And we were sitting here saying, we don't want to contribute to that. Like, how are we going to protect our employees? How are we going to continue to do our work here at the church? And everybody started giving, and we all started having conversations of how we can do that. And we and we were blown away. Like, we were in a better financial position than we thought we'd be yeah. just internally. And then all of a sudden, this gift showed up. And I was like, oh, man. Like, I've been making fun of that Malachi passage for years, <laughs> and now here it is. And, I mean, it's like God is just, the sense of humor of God is incredible. Yes. Um, and it's like Jesus was walking on the water by me laughing at me. Like, come on, I did, you boat. just saw me feed 5,000 people. Get out of the boat. So uh, God didn't rain the money down from heaven. We want to be sure. clear. It came through another person led by the Holy Spirit. And it came together with all that you have been doing to make our church in a position where we can keep doing the work that God has called us to do. And so the question that then we have to look at this morning that we have to consider as we go forward is, what miracle does God have for us next? Are we gonna believe that when we do work worthy of God, God is going to show up? Are we going to expect God to keep moving and working in Grace Chapel even in the next few months when things may seem unclear and uncertain? Are we going to start living with abandon that believes miracles can do and will happen? Like, are we going to get out of the boat and walk on the water? Are we going to, when Jesus says, hey, you go feed 5,000 people, are we going to say, cool, we'll do it. Help us know how. Are we going to be that church? Are we going to believe in miracles and act accordingly? Let us pray. Holy and almighty God, we give thanks that indeed you do move among us. That when we come together as your people, you do miraculous and amazing things. God, we know that um, you are bigger than any hurdle we might face. That you will help us to find the way when there seems there isn't one. That you will... Move and breathe among us and bring us to uh, mountaintops we can't even imagine. God, we give thanks for your work in our lives, and we pray that you might continue to bless us, that we might be, continue to be your people in the world, and that all we do might honor and glorify you. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.